Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the online webinar hosted by the International Data Engineering and Science Association. If you can hear my voice and see a screen, would you please input one at the chat box, please? Okay, great. So everybody can hear me. Okay, uh, I'll give you a brief introduction of the International Data Engineering and the Science Association before the webinar. Um, the, our, account, uh, our association, uh, we call that IDEARS, is a 501c nonprofit organization located in California, Los Angeles. In the past several years, we uh, tried our best to built the community uh, with a concentration in data science and artificial intelligence. So every Saturday and we will uh, host the webinar and invite the uh, speakers with expertise in uh, data science and uh, artificial intelligence to share their thoughts and opinions with our audience. And in the future, we're going to continue the online webinar every weekend and uh, hope we can uh, get more audience and speaker involved in our community. Okay, in the past five years, IDEARS already uh, organized uh, over 10 conference and uh, over 100 meetups and uh, social mixers. And totally, uh, we uh, already uh, invited more than 300 speakers in uh, uh, speak at our conference and uh, over 5,000 attendees in our conference as well. And uh, in this community, we focus on uh, data, AI, and also blockchain as well. And regarding to the industry, we uh, cover the healthcare, fintech, and also the insurance uh, e-commerce. Uh, almost every industry um, related with uh, data science and uh, AI. And uh, well, we have uh, organized a different uh, conference and the meetups all over the US, um, including both the West Coast and also the East Coast. Okay, here are some pictures uh, of our uh, events and uh, in the past few years. And we also organize a lot of events uh, on the top universities all over the US as well. Okay, now we welcome more and more speakers to join our community. If you are in this domain or have the experience in this industry, we welcome to submit your proposal to conference at joinideas.org and uh, you will have the opportunity to speak at our uh, online webinar at, uh, every weekend. So you can just uh, simply send your uh, proposal and your background to the conference at joinideas.org and we'll get connected with you. Okay, today, uh, we're going to uh, have Andrew Zhang, the senior data science engineer at IBM, to give us uh, a share about the data and AI for COVID-19. And uh, I will give you a brief introduction of Andrew. Andrew currently is a senior data science engineer at IBM, and Andrew also a data science and machine learning advocate. His current interest in uh, computer vision uh, an LP and uh, uh, scaling machine learning in the hybrid multi-cloud uh, enterprise environment. Before joining IBM, Andrew was an uh, enterprise architect with Novitist uh, Pharmaceuticals. Previously, he was a senior tech lead managing large-scale news media internet operations in New York. Okay, uh, I will give you the, uh, the screen to Andrew and uh, Welcome, Andrew, to start your uh, webinar here. Can, can everybody hear me? Hi, Andrew, I can hear you. Uh, okay. And I also can see your uh, laptop. Okay, so let your me desktop. See. Okay. Yeah, okay, let me mm -hmm. see my, share my screen.
Can you see my slide? Yes, we can. Okay. All right. Uh, let me get started. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us uh, the webinar on Saturday. Uh, I'm Andrew Zhang and uh, data science engineer working in IBM uh, Cognitive Systems. A um, little bit about my background. Uh, as uh, William introduced that uh, uh, I've been with IBM for four years. So I have experience working with uh, both on distributed systems and also uh, uh, machine learning workload as an engineer. I'm not a research data scientist, um, but uh, I've been working with them a lot. Um, so prior to joining IBM, uh, I worked in pharmaceuticals for many years including web technology and uh, uh, middleware and data warehousing, cloud uh, data warehouse. Uh, and uh, yeah, many all the tech, uh, enterprise stacks I've been working uh, in a uh, you know, pharmaceutical setting. Um, prior to that, I was working on uh, internet uh, professional service, doing consulting and also implementing large scale or internet scale uh, systems for financial media companies. So, yeah, so I'm an open source person and um, um, going through all the years that uh, you just touch different things. Um, so then big data, then AI, and I work, I joined the system groups uh, in IBM about a year ago. So uh, I'm still learning the high performance computing stack. Um, it's a big space. And uh, today I will touch some of the HPC uh, um, opportunity for COVID-19. Um, but I'm not going to go dive deep into uh, AI technology per se, but uh, I will give you uh, some demonstration and also some, uh, uh, maybe I'll sh share some of the, my learning um, process uh, uh, on how we uh, use data and AI to fight uh, COVID-19. So first, first is about the motivation. Why, uh, why I'm interested in uh, uh, data and AI with COVID-19. Um, we all know now COVID-19 had to fundamentally change everybody's life uh, worldwide. But for me, is uh, something happened uh, in March. I got involved into a project which uh, working with uh, many uh, organizations to uh, open the supercomputing resources for many organizations uh, in the US to fight COVID-19. That's the starting point of, uh, uh, for me to uh, learn uh, how people uh, from the academia and also from the industry, from government, uh, how people collaborate together to, uh, to use a supercomputer to, uh, to advance the researches and, uh, and uh, doing collaboration work. The second uh, instance for motivate me to uh, uh, look into deeper in terms of opportunities, how we leverage big data and the analytics uh, to fight COVID-19 is another uh, opportunity for me to see government call to action on all the tech communities to open the data sets. Uh, large number of data sets become available. And uh, from my perspective, I think, you know, it's come to the time that uh, we can truly build a next generation data platform. So that's, uh, that's the motivation. So this is my agenda. So I'll spend some time to talk about uh, uh, this, uh, this uh, consortium for supercomputing, HPC. 
and uh, I'll show you some of the uh, HPC environment and uh, some researchers and the projects. Then, um, then I will touch further deep into some of the interesting uh, COVID-19 data sets, uh, both from you know, tracking and prediction perspective and also from uh, healthcare medical research uh, and development perspective. Uh, finally, I will just uh, showcase some of the modern generation data lakes that uh, the leading tech vendors and the providers uh, uh, created just over the last uh, maybe six to eight weeks. Uh, that is a kind of uh, eye-opening experience for me. Uh, I hope that you also learn something from here. Finally, I will share with you some takeaways. So we all know that uh, um, COVID-19 uh, may not have so time to supercomputing to begin with, but uh, uh, researchers uh, had done uh, uh, discovery and uh, research using supercomputer for a long time, many, many years. Um, but this COVID-19 actually bring together the government, industry, and the academia leaders to access the most powerful computing HPC or high-performance computer resources to in support of COVID-19 research. Um, it's not just COVID-19. I think this research had been researchers have been using this supercomputing for many years, but now um, it just uh, it just come to the time that we need to make this more open to uh, to the general public, meaning that you are not affiliated to a particular organization. You could free submit your proposal to use any supercomputer uh, resources, supercomputing resources in the US. So maybe I should uh, just jump into this uh, link. So before I go there, so there's uh, about uh, 40 organizations and this you can see that uh, IBM is leading the effort with DOE uh, for this consortium. But there's a, a group of uh, 40 something organizations uh, and uh, uh, joined together. Uh, both from industry, most of the leading uh, uh, HPC vendors, and also research uh, universities. Um, and majority of also the DOE national labs also uh, participate in this also. And uh, for myself, uh, I get involved in these first two organizations, RPI and the MIT. Uh, I'm, MIT had a a cluster, uh, HPC cluster, and I was working with them to uh, helping researchers from NIH, Duke, uh, uh, MIT, Yale University to, uh, to move their workload into the high performance uh, computing environment with all the software. So let me see if I can do this. Uh, let me see how it runs. Okay, it works. So, so this is this is a consortium like a White House call for all the uh, organizations to collaborate together to uh, make these uh, supercomputers available for uh, for all the organizations, and you can see some of the the key um, uh, metrics on all this consortium for forty something organizations. Uh, it's about a. Uh, uh, Four million CPU cores and uh, forty-one thousand uh, GPUs and such. So for people, I mean, probably most of you are not deep into this space. I give you a little bit, uh, you know, uh, uh, introduction for uh, supercomputing uh, environment, which uh, this consortium open to people and. Uh, you can see currently the landscape for supercomputing is uh, moving into a hybrid environment. It's a uh, you know, traditional 
high performance computing environment like uh, the right now you can see the DOE at uh, this uh, Oak Ridge Summit, which is a uh, 200 uh, petaflop uh, of for uh, the floating computing operations, 4,000 CPUs. And I think this is the come probably will be 20,000 GPUs on this machine. You can see the transfer data transfer rate is per second is 1.5 terabyte uh, running on IBM spectrum scale storage. Something like that. This is, this, you can call this, this is like the, the, the current state of the art of the supercomputer. Uh, however, there's the other side of the landscape is uh, cloud. So if you see Amazon, they open this uh, super HPC environment, but you don't see a specific further uh, fixed node or configuration. So it's highly configurable and uh, scalable. Uh, currently, I think this, uh, this is going to be a trend uh, based on what I know that uh, the cloud offered uh, quite a few advantages than the traditional HPC environment. Same as Google. So these are the, the, tech, uh, the hardware and software stacks uh, go along with uh, the, their HPC environment. <coughs> Yeah, many of these are national labs and also Microsoft. <clears throat> I'm not familiar with all the vendors configuration and hardware stacks, <laughs> but they are very much similar in terms of the architecture. Um, but you know that ultimately <clears throat> you consume the computing resource uh, for your particular scientific workload. Okay, so let me quickly show you something else. <clears throat> Can someone give me a feedback? Uh, are you okay listening to me or do I lose you? <laughs> Hopefully not. Yeah, we are good now. I cannot even see the... Okay, okay. As long as you tell me you are, you are there, you listen to me, that's fine. <laughs> so this is a, a, a MIT environment. I, the way I want to show you is show you some of the uh, softwares we run on this environment and the tools we use. Uh, for example, Monday, coming Monday, I'm having a meeting about this tool. So basically this is a Quail EM software. <clears throat> that for researchers to do microscope, electronic microscope uh, imaging processing, and uh, they need to submit the, the jobs through, uh, through uh, this software. This is a com some of these are commercial software, some of these are open source software. And uh, we spend a lot of time to uh, build this uh, software stack for researchers. And uh, the tools are not very, uh, it's not very much friendly from commercial compared to some of the modern commercial software because they are scientific, very research oriented, um, but they are very critical workload from universities and the research organizations. So I won't go for further deep into this, uh, just give you an idea of the environment I'm operating in. Or operate the ways. <laughs> this is a configuration for this MIT Sartori cluster. So I'm working with some MIT and uh, IBM AI lab researchers and uh, and the university uh, faculty and researchers to uh, to uh, collaborate to open this computing uh, environment to many different of workloads, uh, quite a few. So let's, uh, let's talk about a little bit about what they are doing there with this uh, consortium. And uh, uh, I also have a link, I think uh, I can go back. But, uh, but basically they're doing three type of things uh, for research. Uh, maybe they call it basic science, 
Uh, you may not be able to read this very clearly, but this kind of understand the virus and from structure and uh, uh, perspective, you know, uh, and also understand the, the virus, viral and the human interaction. And uh, that's basic science. Then the second category of the research are done in um, uh, therapeutics. Uh, how you understand, uh, find the target so that you can, you know, uh, attack to cure the disease. Um, there are also drug repurposing, uh, repurposing. You know, we know some of the drugs we're now talking about for COVID-19 is a repurpose some older drugs, but we still need to understand the, 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 the mechanics underneath. And finally, you also have a patient side of research, um, whether it's, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the outcome of your treatment, um, maybe also the epidemiology type aspect of, you know, transmission and the tracing and and some other supply chain and the resource allocation, like uh, quarantine, testing, this type of thing. Um, so I also want to show you, in fact, a quick, some of the researchers they've done. And um, if you're working in HPC or in, in a research university, you probably see this already, some, but um, for, most of people you haven't been in the space. This may be uh, uh, interesting. So the so these are the active projects. You can see that uh, we say there were forty something projects, but re really I think I counted this morning it's probably sixty seventy nowadays, because this this consortium only opened since early April, and it's just about thirty days. Uh, so uh, that uh, people are submitting the research project every day. And they get, uh, you know, under a committee for review and uh, approval. And then they decided which particular supercomputer cluster they want you to be sitting on based on your requirement and workload. Um, so I can mention some of the interesting or not so interesting ones. Because <laughs> for example, this one is talking about a research for physician decision support is a lot, um, you know, helping the physician to decide how to use the, the ventilators. So you can have the ventilator split, splits between two or more patients. But in order for them to do this, they have to use some software to guide the device selection and simulate different state of the respiratory state of the patient. So I guess that's, that's hardware software, but it requires a lot of data crunching and uh, analyzing and simulation and understand and work as expected. Not saying I know this all the research, I kind of understand, but majority of this I don't know in detail, but I can understand some of these uh, tags and the categories. Uh, for example, this is for privacy aware, uh, aware contact tracing. Um, yeah, so these are the, so basically if you, you, re, you, you are a researcher, you are now, uh, you are now qualified, any researcher can submit a application to this consortium and they, you can require, you know, large number of computing resources for your research. In fact, I found out for, based on my conversation with some of the researchers, uh, this is actually pretty important for people to use. Uh, to, uh, let me make sure I'm still on. Am I still on? Sometimes yeah. my, Yes, because sometimes my home Wi-Fi signal is not very stable. I am using my phone to make sure that I got a stable connection. 
So just uh, just let me know or ping me every like five, 10 minutes, make sure that you're there. Sure, okay. I'll give you some feedback. Thank you. Okay, so we touched, I just touched about this supercomputing uh, consortium, but this is just one of it. You may all have your own, you know, uh, uh, research environment. This is just addition for for you to uh, to run your job faster, get uh, your project funded and uh, supported, uh, uh, getting your research published as quickly as possible. So this is a, this is a, I mean, I'm sharing just my personal experience. There's so many, so many uh, development out there, but uh, I think this is pretty cool and pretty interesting for researchers. So the second one, uh, as I mentioned, I want to just uh, uh, share with you some of my uh, learning on this uh, data sets currently available. You probably know already, given the current situation, uh, you know, there's a lot of, uh, lot of uh, press on what's going on. There's a lot of numbers published every day on newspaper, on TV, on internet, and helping us to understand uh, the COVID-19 from many, many aspects. And these are information, these are data, these are data sets. So, so to start off is also something from White House. They, uh, there's, a, there's a Office of the Science and Technology Policy Office, and uh, they collaborate and uh, give instructions and guide the uh, uh, nationwide initiatives to, uh, uh, to, um, to drive the science and technology. Um, so they, uh, the office are request uh, open uh, machine readable COVID-19 literature. So as you know, this COVID-19 just started probably in like uh, January or so, like three, four months uh, right now. But there's many, many articles and researchers that go into this space very, very quickly, vast amount of them. Uh, you know, people publish paper like every day and uh, you don't, you, you're doing something, someone else doing something and uh, you've done something people done already or you're doing something the same as other people doing. So you want to learn and you want to know. And, and so this is important to make sure that we open and uh, help researchers to understand what's going on in terms of a research publication pattern and uh, I even try to understand who is the leading researcher in a particular subdomain. Um, and the, all these are very, very important because time is so pressing right now for us to advance, say, vaccine or medicine development. And um, let me open this maybe. Okay. So this is, a, this is a other letter, I mean, beside HPC. So this is some um, um, research or nonprofit research institute collaborated with uh, uh, the Stackenberg Foundation and uh, Microsoft, uh, NLM, NIH. But anyhow, this is an article and you see that we say this is 20, 29,000, that is like in March. But uh, actually, I think today is 59,000 as of May. So you can see it's probably like 30,000 articles published since uh, maybe uh, 45 days. Um, so this is a hosted, initially hosted over here. I lost it, one second. One important uh, platform worth mentioning is Kaggle. Uh, if you're a data scientist, you know that Kaggle is uh, like uh, the, the, the master platform to host uh, 
you know, computations, share data, share practice, share code, share algorithm, collaborate, discuss with your peers, a uh, particular uh, uh, machine learning or data science uh, uh, challenge. And if you go to the Kaggle data set, uh, website today, um, you see this data set also opened there. But I want to show you a little bit so that you understand what it's trying to do for this particular data set. Um, so as I mentioned to you before, I hope this is getting some, so this is updated seven days ago. So they're constantly getting updated. Yes, so this is 49,000 seven days ago, but I see another number because this is not a root of the source. They are taking the data from that foundation. So that foundation probably have 49 articles, 49,000, but this is 47. Um, but uh, you see this, you know that they actually try to uh, get this type of uh, data, metadata uh, for you, like abstracts and the keywords and uh, even the national, uh, the articles, uh, journals published the, 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 the article and uh, also the full text for this. Uh, it's not just metadata, I, I guess it's how you do data mining for a particular research topic. These are the pre-print, pre like medical and bio uh, uh, archives. Uh, just like computer science, if you're working on machine learning, deep learning, we have so many archive uh, preprints, right? So. Okay. So this is a, this is a, the same same data set. I sure what are you can get an answer from these articles or full text. Uh, so these are the questions that can, can be answered by doing the data mining and the maybe uh, uh, data, uh, uh, data, data mining or data analysis or even just uh, 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 you have to go for the full text sometimes. But at first you have to find the, the right one to, to read, right? So these are the like uh, understand transmission, incubation, uh, understand the risk factor for maybe different country, different time, uh, know the gen genetics, uh, origin and evolution of the virus and, uh, and uh, any publication about uh, how do you do treatment or medical care. So happen to be, uh, I was also for imaging stuff, and uh, we have an IBM. I work with a computer vision platform, and we do this uh, Kaggle type of thing and the open data. But you know, it's hard to get a hospital to release data to public. Uh, they don't do that. Uh, it's actually almost impossible to for hospital to give the data out to other people. But if you're writing a research paper that is uh, highly possible. You can get uh, approved pretty quickly. So this is one of these uh, uh, examples. Uh, you can get uh, this uh, medical imaging for X-ray and CT uh, published to, uh, 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 not published, to be open. So this one from Databricks, uh, some of the use cases, you know that, uh, um, you know the John Hopkins had uh, this data sets. Uh, basically they federated the, the data from worldwide through CDC of different countries, European, China, uh, or WHO, whatever, and then, then make it uh, generally available. Uh, like a tracking or dashboard using that, that data source. Uh, so in fact, I did some experiment. I could use the data set to, uh, to create a visualization understanding, at least in the US, you can do by county level, how many uh, cases, how many deaths, and then maybe say 
ratio per 1000 K population because the census data is uh, also available. You can also get a tracking for genomics, uh, epidemiological, uh, that uh, there's a one, uh, one organization, I wouldn't say company, I don't know it's a company, but it's one organization did a fantastic job for this uh, tracking. And uh, there's a blog article from Databricks uh, talking about this. Maybe I'll take a quick look for you. So, yeah, so this is, this is, a, this is a, the dashboard. You can get a notebook here. And uh, I mean, right now it seems like a lot of green, but last time I run this all red, all red in the US because the, the confirmed cases are too, too many. And you can do this. Uh, I was trying to show you this interface. Uh, yeah. So anybody with a data set, you could create your own visualization and, and, uh, and uh, dashboard or tracking or mapping and everything can be very fancy but specialized for a particular medical or healthcare data set. And but this, is a, this is one of the example how, 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 uh, how it looks like. Um, they are organizations tracking hospital resources. Uh, and this is the University of Washington does offer uh, some of the modeling projections. So this is just a snap, uh, like a screenshot of it. Um, but uh, I think uh, uh, if you go to their website, they will give you their flavor of uh, for right. So uh, that's uh, that is uh, this one. Okay. Okay. So we covered them. Um, data sets, we cover the research literature article, their medical imaging, their Kaggle. Uh, Kaggle, in fact, they're every day, I've been talking to a few people, so every other day, I know there's somebody saying they discover something new there. So there were like a, a few days ago, people telling me that they found out that there's a data set by combining weather inform data plus uh, social media data plus uh, the base data set from Kaggle. So you can use those features to run further more analysis and uh, doing EBA or, or run other models to see the risk for you to get uh, infected, the risk gets you, you get uh, you know, the, the probability you, you should be you know, uh, quarantined or should be you know, contact tracing, whatever. So based on your, you know, uh, based on your parameter. Um, so speaking about the supercomputing resources, speaking about the data sets, they all, you know, uh, very much resourceful nowadays for you to, to consume. But, uh, but right, because uh, the many and so diverse, uh, it's very difficult to consume uh, as an average person, either you are a data scientist or researcher, you, you need a more centralized and a type of platform help you to navigate that system, no matter what's been added tomorrow, right? Um, so I was looking some of these ones and then actually I started with the one called C3.ai because my uh, former IBM they went there and uh, uh, they told me so, and I look at there, then from there, I, I find out the other ones. And I keep getting new discoveries every day on you know, what's out there. So if you look at uh, from, from Amazon, they also offer the same data set for these uh, confirmed cases. I don't know they get it from uh, John Hopkins or uh, New York Times, because each, each organization get this data source from uh, maybe the same source or different source, but they verify, they confirm, they validate, they pick the best one they think they could use. Here you go. So you can find this in Amazon public data lake. 
you can also find the uh, say testing data, hospital bed data. Uh, this is the same data. Uh, see, this, everybody say the number different. It depends on time when they <laughs> when they capture. This is probably outdated also. Okay, this is 40, 45,000, right? So it's different. But Amazon also have a uh, like a medical, uh, like a natural language processing tool doing annotation or, or like an extraction. So it's probably pre-processed by Amazon already. I haven't verified that. Um, uh, the one of the important uh, capability for data lake is you provide the raw data before you send to ETL for data warehouse or for machine learning. Um, then you need a very powerful browser or explorer engine. And a lot of organizations don't have that easily built up. And Amazon S3 Explorer is a good one for them to use. Uh, so if you click this, you get all the objects, all the data. Uh, it's a tree structure, you can look at it. And uh, they also have a ETL uh, called something simple ETL uh, called glue. I personally haven't really used it too much, but I heard a lot about it. I heard this is uh, something people are using a lot nowadays. And uh, they also have a serverless SQL engine. Um, so all these tools are built on cloud and making this data available, but making this data easy to be consumed. Few more things here. Um, maybe so you need a you need an Amazon AWS account. You need a, some permission create a cloud formation. You need some other resources to run uh, AWS Glue. So they give you the metadata and the metadata data catalog. So this is pretty good. If you have a data lake, this kind of like, like uh, the catalog of your data lake high level, you can develop something further, but uh, I won't go for dips into it. I want to show you something here. Uh, so this is the query engine. Ah, so remember I said that they, they have this public data set and uh, say if you're using AWS or using something uh, similar and then you can use a visualization engine to create a dashboard pretty quickly. And here you go. So basically, if you really understand the schema and data structure, and you have a integrated cloud environment, you can create a visualization based on some template people created you are a developer or not developer. You understand how to assemble things together. You can create something like this reasonably quickly because it's ready to consume. Okay, so I'm 30 minutes, so. Uh, I won't go for further. I think Google does something similar. They call it a public data set or data lake, but they use something is like a, here called a big query. So they use big query to federate these data sets. Uh, they are still loosely connected. Um, I hope one day people, actually I'll show you something at the end. Somebody build a knowledge graph to try to trace and track these dispersed data sets. So final things, I think if you are researchers for COVID-19, uh, you need to be aware of nowadays, it's not just uh, this particular HPC consortium. I think both cloud and on-premise vendors, including uh, IBM and uh, Google, we all offer a huge discount of free services for you to run your uh, HPC uh, workload on cloud or on-premise, you just need to ask. Uh, 
secondly, uh, if you want to be on the cutting edge on data science for COVID-19, you need to watch on what's available for uh, open and public data on Kaggle. And uh, at, uh, a lot of people working on it. You can find that people on the same, uh, same type of research interests are learning something to uh, join data together and uh, find the new features, ask the right questions, empower your organization to do something more. And uh, for data providers, and just like a, a Amazon, I don't totally consider it as a uh, data provider they can, but uh, many people provide a data service. You could unify the data source, meaning just even you consume uh, like a Google or Amazon's data lake, you consume them, you can unify the data source. Then from there, you can provide services like uh, through API. And that's some companies already start doing it. And uh, as a developer, you could create uh, intelligent application based on the real time COVID-19 data worldwide. It is totally possible today. So with that, I think I'm done with my presentation. Uh, if I have a few minutes, I can run a few other references. But uh, I think this is about uh, 40 minutes. I can take some questions. If not, I can show you some more stuff here. OK, uh, thank you, Andrew. And uh, for all the audience, if you have any question, you can just input your question at the Q&A or at the chat box. And uh, we'll, we still have some time to uh, share your questions and have Andrew to give you some ideas. OK, yeah, I think there are some, um, some questions on the, on the chat, chat Q&A. Can you help me to read some of this? Or? Yeah, sure. Kind of a little small. <laughs> right. Um, okay, I can. Let me the see. last one, I have the Richard here. He has questions. The data available is based on lockdown scenario, but the economics uh, economics have started opening up. How can we account for that for future predictions? Okay. So, was the last question? Right. Oh, lockdown. Data, av data available is based on a uh, lockdown scenario, but the economics has started opening up. How can we count for that for future prediction? Wow, yeah. <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's a question for Donald Trump. <laughs> I guess, uh, um, no, I, I mean, all these scenarios are based on certain assumptions and uh, and parameters, and we can only try so much. The problem with this COVID-19 is we don't have a complete data for every single one at uh, every single time. So we have to build some model, we have to, but uh, can we totally rely on this model for future? No, we have to monitor the model and we have to adjust the model uh, based on the progress, based on the feedback, right? If you know AI, AI need a feedback. You don't have feedback, you, you, you set to fail. So uh, I don't know I can totally answer, answer that question. Uh, in fact, my talk today was not trying to focus on building these predictive models, but uh, more and less try to share some of the potential opportunities to take advantage of the, the data, the compute, and then learn from say Kaggle or some model algorithms for your own case. Um, yeah. Okay, and uh, I have the Jason here. He asked if you can share the PowerPoint file and the links to them. So I'm not sure. What is the best um, to share all these links? Yeah, I uh, I need to clean up some of the things here, uh, but uh, maybe you can send me an email uh, or 
send me it. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. If yeah, someone's interested. Cause, uh, cause, uh, it's actually, I consider this is uh, something pretty rough because I just made a slide today. I need to verify a few more things, but I'm open to share privately. If I share to you, don't uh, make it uh, so much open public. Um, because I will make an additional version in the coming days and I will do the same thing with my customer and the client. Although all these, nothing is a secret, are open, these are all, all open information, but uh, I hope you can understand. Mm -hmm. That's a good idea. If someone interested in these links, you can send the email to andrew.jung at ibm.com and Andrew will share with you some of the links there. And also uh, regarding to the PowerPoint, welcome to upload the video to our uh, YouTube channel uh, later next week. So if you're interested, get more uh, details in the whole uh, webinar, you can uh, visit our uh, YouTube channel to review the video there. And uh, okay, uh, any more questions? Andrew? If you don't, I can uh, still share some other information, which I think this is more like a resource or information sharing than, uh, than... So there's a course from Stanford University if you're interested in learning data science and AI for COVID-19 called a CS472. And you can write it down now if you're really interested to learn this more uh, in a systematic way. And they put up this course uh, just a few weeks ago uh, from this professor. And uh, they have a researchers come in or, or speakers, guest speakers uh, to talk about different topics like ICU operation and then send for drug. Uh, machine learning, NLP, uh, so different, different uh, special uh, topics for this uh, COVID-19 use cases. Uh, so I think that's a pretty good one for you to, uh, to, uh, to dive deeper into this. And this is why I mentioned the COVID-19 knowledge graph they're trying to build. So remember, there's so many data sets and they're trying to kind of also uh, build a data lake, establish a uh, linkage for the data sets. Um, I, yeah, I haven't really looked into it. I had a meeting with them and they, they had op open API, want, to me to, want me to try. Um, but I know they put a, put a big effort to make this available for, for everybody they want to build a data platform or data lake and uh, this knowledge graph is also kind of their uh their the, the, the innovation or something like uh, like uh, yeah something new to 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 build so this yeah for them is actually integrate data source but then ultimately you know anybody can use it think about you know, people usually have a private data lake on premise or on cloud, but uh, how much time take you to, to, uh, to clean the data, annotate data, build a data model, run the ETL, ELT, build the infrastructure and run different type of uh, analysis. But this data somewhat is a little bit more cleaned and integrated, right? So I mean, it's a very special subdomain just for COVID-19, but it's a perfect example how to build something successfully successfully given uh, given a particular use case um, I think that's it if there's no questions there's maybe six more minutes left okay. uh, we have another question here for Andrew mm. They asked, it appears that many projects we have seen in the slides do not need to, do not need the scale of supercomputing hmm. in the first line. So I guess maybe it's mostly for pharmaceuticals drug discovery. Hmm. That's a question. Huh. 
actually, yeah, um, it's a it's a it's a not reasonable question, I guess. Uh, before I get into supercomputing or HPC, uh, I always assume everybody can just use uh, regular, you know, uh, IT infrastructure or cloud or like a large cluster. But uh, remember what I mentioned about uh, the summit supercomputer done on the research labs and uh, universities. You have to understand that most of the researchers, they, they come from that community. They run their simulation discovery over there. Uh, so that's, uh, that's, a, that's a big community. Um, but if you say you're doing a startup, uh, likely you are not uh, get to be exposed to HPC. But uh, I just use this as a showcase that you can go ask anybody, support your uh, computing environment, whether they offer something for say, uh, free trial discount. I know Google, Amazon, IBM, they all have this type of offers. Cause you know that if you run machine learning, deep learning, particularly the computing expense for GPU or TPU is a big problem, right? Uh, and uh, if you, you do serious work, you need it. Uh, if you just do some trial, maybe you only need it for like a couple weeks, but uh, long term, that's not the model. Okay, uh, thank you, Andrew. Uh, I see no uh, questions there, and uh, thank you for your time. And uh, I think it's a time almost there. And uh, um, I think if, if the audience has any uh, questions, can send us email at conference at joinideas.org. And uh, uh, well, welcome to have you here again next Saturday. Okay, and uh, our webinar will be uh, end here. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, everyone. Okay, thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.